year and a half, and I loved it dearly. Um, I'm going to read really sort of an abridged version of the first chapter of my book. I'm an immersion journalist, and really, I think in layman's terms, the best way to describe it is I do documentaries on paper. And this book is the result of six years of reporting and uh, 10 months to a year of intense immersion inside a small community in northeastern South Africa, inside the apartheid era homeland region, which in the United States, the closest thing we can equate that to are Native American reservations. Except for the fact that during apartheid, um, when you read literature or you've seen films or had memory of things being discussed during the apartheid era, you think about uh, people carrying passbooks. And the idea of the passbook was to give someone permission to leave their designated homeland area to go and work in the city or live in the townships and elsewhere. And so um, Roybach is a community that sits inside one of two homelands that were sort of butt up right next to one another. The only thing that separated them was railroad tracks. The Shangan community and Sutu community lived there. And I lived about 15 minutes north of Roybach. I'm actually just going to jump in. There are three people inside the covers of this book. Toko is sort of the most lively character I can bring you to. <clears throat> Toko Makwakwa was always open for business. Balancing beside her open back door, the totem of two speakers and red Coca-Cola crates throughout Kweto music, a South African fusion of hip-hop, house music, and jazz. Had you passed through this crooked door two years earlier, you would have found Toko's pots and pans, her chip mugs and mismatched silverware, her kitchen table and chairs, her tabletop baker and hot plates, her electric oven and stovetop, bins of maize meal and baggies of dried mapani worms, and possibly a few barrels of water. But the kitchen had been moved to a small sitting room and inside now stood a warp snooker table and a bright red jukebox. Toko, a 42-year-old long-limbed, raw-boned woman with two missing front teeth, had converted her kitchen into a shabim, a backdoor off the books pub. Men sat at the stoop of Toko's nine-room house with bottles of Black Label, America's lusty, lively beer, and yellow plastic buckets of traditional brew. Young boys and their older brothers or fathers, who only appear at the end of each month, were playing snooker in the shabim while music rumbled and the tin roof rattled. Single ran coins were slipped into the jukebox barred and bolted against the crumbling handmade wall, and voices of Zulu, Sutu, English, and Kosa jumped from the speakers. Music swirled around the customers riding on the backs of springtime winds, down the hill towards the river's reed-filled edge, or up toward the cemetery that borders the open bush. Men just off the bus or taxi from the north, south, and west where they work in the trees, city, factory, or fields, fed one ram coins into the billiard table and five ram coins into the hands of Toko's children for a bucket of shikapka, traditional beer. The older men, retired on medical disability or simply out of work, sat with it in their hands, cheaper than the bottles of beer and a preferred taste for the more traditional tongue, not to mention more effective in making the world spin. Buckets with the grainy residue of shikapka, consumed over time or in long, purposeful gulps, lay on the ground and in stacks. The crack of a snooker break or the start of a new song rained like a till through the bodies and buildings in Togo's yard. As the sun went down and the moon crawled into the endless sky, customers multiplied. The sweet smell of sweat pouring down gyrating bodies was the fragrance of Togo <coughs> making money. It was payday. Toko's homestead was a collection of four plots, rented from the local tribal authority. A chain-link fence lined its perimeter, supported by a collection of mismatched, waist-high iron poles and tree branches collected from the surrounding bush. A large, rectangular, western-style cement house, two cement randables, and three mud-packed single rooms had been built on two plots, while the other two, dust and weed-filled plots, sat empty. At month end, there are two kinds of pockets. Some are quiet, filled with crisp bills of blue buffalo, pink lions, brown elephant, green rhino, and maybe even a few leopard. 
Others are filled with noisy proteas and lilies, springbok and kudu, and hopefully a few black wildebeest in the herd. The men who've returned for their few days of month-end holiday arrive with cash-filled envelopes or crisp bills, just pulled from the mouth of an ATM. Their pockets are mute, at least before they enter Toko's gates. Those who cross the threshold already jingling have generally been around all month, looking forward to the sight of more men, the arrival of friends, fathers, sons, and brothers. The noisy ones count five cents, 10 cents, proteas, and lilies until there is enough to fill a garden, enough to exchange for a single springbok to play a song. Those who put their hands in their pockets to prevent the click and clank of their savings pull a collection of sweaty antelope for a bucket to drink around the corner, out of sight. Once empty, it's quickly replaced with a bottle of black label to hold while the traditional buzz crawls through their bodies. Two single-room thatched buildings sit just inside Toko's gates. The one on the right is for her mother's ancestors. The one on the left is for her father's ancestors. The second is Toko's Inumba, where she consults with clients. While many men and the occasional woman play games, drink, sing, and dance, inside and around the Shabin, Toko sits inside her Ndumba as a Singoma, connecting with her ancestors, answering questions about health, wealth, fidelity, and flow. During the first weekend after payday, Toko's businesses were equally busy. Lines would form outside her Ndumba with people sitting around the tree and on the ledge of the opposite rundavel. Bodies would fill her old kitchen, and the ledge around her Western-style house resembled the Saturday night quarters of an urban Shabin queen. During the last week of September, when the early winter chills had passed and the spring gusts were dancing like children in the street, Toko sat in her Ndumba with a worried mother and deteriorating daughter. The three women sat on traditionally woven grass mats laid across the cement floor, two on the left overlapping like the letter B, skewed by the curve of the wall. A third sangu crossed the center of the room, parallel with three white sheets strung on a laundry line and fastened with plastic clothespins, partitioning the far third of the room from view. An emaciated young woman, Lindiwe, sat against the wall beside her mother and opposite Toko, who knelt on her knees in the center of the room, preparing to connect with her father's ancestors. She pulled on her red, blue, and white beaded necklace and bracelets as a Western physician dresses in a lab coat and hangs a stethoscope around her neck. It was symbolic of credentials, symbolic of status and profession. And with the final fasten of her bracelet's lanyard-like loop, she pulled the far edge of her sangu toward her, revealing the floor beneath. As she reached for an arm-length sphere relief from the edge of the white curtain, Lindiwe's mother placed her 100 grand payment on the cold cement floor. Toko used the wooden handle of her spear to cover, but not touch the crinkled note. She flipped the edge of the sangu to hide the staring blue buffalo placed there by the apprehensive mother, cognizant of the ancestor's power, edgy for what could be. The glittery golden ink on the bill's lower right corner, popping the numbers 100, sat at the edge of the blue buffalo's chin, an amount the mother had collected over weeks and topped off by month end payday. About $14, or 100 rand, Roughly one half of a monthly child grant, 40 loaves of bread, 14 liters of cool drink, or just over half the initial cost of a tribal housing plot, or one student's annual school fees. 100 grand to answer the questions that plagued her daughter, 100 grand to reveal the reasons for her daughter's paralysis and pain, to offer what she saw as a propitious treatment for her child's deterioration. Inside her Ndumba, Toko pulled a small burlap bag from behind the curtain revealing for just a moment hundreds of bottles. After opening its top and rolling down its sides, Toko held the bag with both hands, like an offering. She reached beneath the neckline of her shirt, skimming the beaded necklace and its two acorn-shaped pendants, digging around the confines of her bra's right cup. She pulled out a plastic disc-shaped container with a yellow cap. Removing the top, she pinched three fingers like a claw, extracted dark brown snuff, and dusted the contents of her bag. Lowering her head and arching her body toward the left, Toko lifted a dash of snuff to each nostril and sniffed. Kutsaha, sniff, kutsaha, sniff. Toko's muti ingredients were hidden behind that stained white curtain. 
Her collection had grown from 170 when she first trained to 240 bottles, jars, tins, paper bags, and sheets of newspaper filled with shaven, diced, sliced, braided brown in the full portions of flora and fauna from in and around the region. Years of dust covered the caps and dirt caked each crevice, from beer and whiskey bottles to hair cream canisters and shoe polish tins, baby food and jam jars, pharmacy vials and vitamin bottles. The cross between a pharmaceutical cabinet and a hoarder's treasure hid behind the curtain. Half a dozen matchboxes, nearly a dozen dung beetle balls, three spears, porcupine quills, crumpled pieces of paper, used razors, a few roots in whole form, and two pieces of wood. Speaking softly, with a voice deeper and raspier than outside of her nose, Togo lifted the bag and tilted it to the, to the right, shaking in a circular motion, filling the grass mat before her with the contents of the bag. Dominoes and currency, bones from the lion, elephant, zebra, bush pig, steenbuck, and baboon. One small water level, marula and futsu seeds, an odd collection of shells including one large black cowrie, and several other objects with origins in the bush. As the last item hit the mat, she dropped the empty bag and picked up the plastic canister of snuff once more. With her right pointer finger, Toko lifted a dash of snuff up, up to each nostril and sniffed, just as she had done minutes before. Kutsaha, sniff, kutsaha, sniff. With this second inhalation, Toko's voice began to dig deeper and deeper, raspier and raspier, chanting in question and seeking the ancestors for help, repeating two words over and over again, connected by the tap of her wooden spear on the cement floor. Shavuma, tap, shavuma, tap, shavuma, tap. Matching the rhythm of her body motion, Toko rocked forward and back, forward and back. Shavuma, tap, shavuma, tap, shavuma, tap. With each lean backward, she sought the ancestors to join her in identifying why this girl had come, why she was sitting before her, and what problems she had for her to solve. Shavuma, she repeated, Shavuma. Speak, she encouraged the ancestors, speak. Toko began to tell Lindiwe that she was sick. The wooden spear moved forward, pointing the objects on the mat that identified her symptoms. Malengi Yarina, she said, pointing to an object on her sangu. Your legs. Vocal Yawena, she said, pointing toward another. Your arms. Pain in your arms and legs, she elaborated. Never looking up, always pointing toward or inspecting the objects strewn across the grass mat. Silence filled the stale, confined air of the Aduba as she looked for something within the objects spread across its center. Toko began to sweep the bones from the grass mat into a mound before her, leaning across the sangu, reaching as far as her arms would take her. From these objects, she pulled a blotched cowrie shell the size of her fist and began to encircle the mound like the moon orbits the earth. One, two, three. Its open base never left the mat while she drew the revolving pattern, not until the third circle was complete, after which she placed the shell on the mound of bones and picked them up in the scoop of her hands just barely enough to hold the collection. She began to move her hands upward and then let them drop to hit the mat, causing the rattle of each object, a motion she repeated three times before the final lift and release of the bones, across the mat, off the sides, onto the floor, and there it was. The ancestors were revealing the truth. The large cowrie shell had flipped. Sitting on the ground amongst a constellation of bones, paranormally arranged, was the white underbelly of the cowrie shell and its jagged toothed opening. The young woman was ill because the ancestors were calling her to fulfill her predestined mission in life. They were calling her to train. She had been chosen to become a single. Thank you.